What book are we studying? Revelation. Oh, yes. That's right. Does that have an S on the end of it? Yes, sir. Uh, all right. Let's turn to the Revelation. Not that we'll get very far in the text today. Because a book well, in, uh, book well introduced is a book what? All right, half thought, well learned to work. And that is so true, and that's especially true of this book. It's a very great and important book. I know that goes against the grain of what some think. All 65 prior books of the Bible look forward to the book of Revelation. Revelation is the culmination of all of the purposes of God. It's the grand finale, if you will. How many of you go to a fireworks display and you don't wait till the end to see all of the sky lit up and you look at the grand finale? A lot of people have approached the Bible that way and they forget to read and study the grand finale for a few reasons that we'll talk about in just a moment. This is the crowning book of the Bible. In the beginning, we see the tree of life. And we see where paradise, that garden of Eden, was lost. In the book of Revelation, we see the tree of life at the end. And we see where paradise can be regained. <clears throat> Turn to Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. When we think about key texts of the book of Revelation. This one should not be forgotten by any stretch of the imagination. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. I believe that's the key text of the book of Revelation. The kingdoms of this earth will fall. The kingdom of Christ will be victorious. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3, we need to highlight this verse. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. Let me read that again. Especially for those that have come to this book and have kept it shut, have neglected it because they say this can't be understood or this is too difficult to understand. That idea is wrong. If we've done nothing in this class but to dispel that idea in your mind, we have, we have gained ground. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. Now the Holy Spirit knew that one day in the year 2019, we would be sitting in this class and we would read that verse. C.H. Dodd of Cambridge University, a scholar in New Testament theology, A very learned man, and, a, and especially learned in the book of Revelation. He was the author of many commentaries on the book, and he began thinking that the message could not be totally understood. And he changed his mind quickly as he delved into this great book. And so it is with us. So many times, the book of Revelation has been neglected. It has been misunderstood, and it has been grossly perverted. But so it's been with other major biblical topics and books. That should not surprise us. Clear subjects, much clearer than the book of Revelation, grossly perverted. How about the plan of salvation? How about eternal security? How about, and you name it, you can probably find something written about it from a false perspective. 
The book of Revelation is no different, but many times the reason we neglect it is that we're not used to its language. The book of Revelation is not a difficult book to understand once we understand the figures. Many readers pass it by with the attitude, uh, with the prevailing belief that it cannot be understood. You know, many uh, school students start out school that way, right? I just can't learn this. It's too difficult for me. How many math classes have begun in the minds of students and they get their book and what do they do? Instead of taking the introduction and reading the introduction, they open that book and they just let it fall open to chapter 6 and they see all the equations and they say, no way. That's what the Bible student does with the book of Revelation. Perhaps they've taken it as a type of nighttime tranquilizer before they go to bed. And they've let it fall open to Revelation mm -hmm. chapter 12, and they said, are you kidding me? I can have nightmares greater than this. I hope we can erase that thinking from your mind. You're going to see at the end of this study, and only the Lord knows how long that's going to be, that this book, it's very simple. Sometimes the attitude is had by its readers it is by far the less read book of all of the New Testament. And it is. Usually when we read the New Testament, we skip Revelation. No, we'll read the first uh, three chapters of Revelation, right? The seven churches. Then after chapter three, we don't pick it up again until chapters 21 and 22. But all that in between, we don't really delve into it that much. Like Matthew chapter 1, right? We begin the New Testament, we always start with Matthew chapter 2, don't we? We don't want to pronounce all those words. We're not used to those words. We're not used to the figures in Revelation, so we ignore that. It's a strange book to many, and to many a closed book. Some commentators have said it is abandoned as quite unintelligible, a different world, notoriously difficult. The playground of religious eccentrics. I think that was my favorite one. <laughs> Revelation is the playground of religious eccentrics. There are as many riddles in the book of Revelation as there are words. The book of Revelation will either find a man mad or leaves him mad. I'm going to insist that we begin this study with the belief that we can understand, that we can comprehend, and that we can use this to grow our own spiritual lives and the spiritual lives of others. And I know that's going to take a radical transformation of mind for some people. But it's true. Let me suggest this. In our time together, this cannot be a passive study. And that's why I'm afraid to do the book of Revelation in the auditorium class. The last time I did this, it was downstairs. You know the auditorium class of all of the classes in the church building. For those who want to be passive Bible students, where do they go to class? They think they need to go to class, so they come to class. But they don't get real engaged, and they come in the auditorium class and they sit. No pen and paper. Many times, no Bible open. And many more times than not, no preparation coming in. If you want to make this time worthwhile, you're not going to be that kind of student. So will you pretend that we're not in the auditorium during this study? <laughs> we are in another room, and we're not as spread out as we are. We're, we're more compacted, and we're together, and we are engaged. Now, I'm going to give you a reprieve this week, but next week. Please come with an open Bible. Please come having read 
Revelation chapter 1, and any introductory material you can get your hands on. And I, I have a lot of suggestions for you if you would like to uh, get some nice, concise commentaries to begin with uh, that would promote your study. But please do not view this class as something passive and you're taking up a seat. Because then you're going to come to the end and you're going to say, well, what happened? I still don't understand it. You can get this. You can do this. The word revelation comes from the Greek word apocalypsis. What word do you hear in apocalypsis? Yeah, apocalypse. And what does apocalypse mean? Have you ever seen a movie called The Apocalypse? What does the word apocalypse mean? Reveal. Reveal. Good. Uncover. Reveal or uncover. The apocalypse. The revelation. A supernatural uncovering of God's grand finale to which all 65 books look forward. It is the unveiling, it's an unveiling in a dramatic, figurative form how the church is victorious over all enemies and deadly attacks headed by, here you go, the very first figure, by the great dragon. The great dragon. <clears throat> I don't think I even have to define what a dragon is, do I? We don't have to spend the next two Sundays talking about dragons, do we? And I bet I could ask each one of you, who is the great dragon of the book of Revelation, and you could tell me. In fact, I won't ask each one individually, I'll ask as a group. Who is the great dragon of the book of Revelation? Wow is good. It is Satan. That's all the book of Revelation is. <clears throat> all we have to know who's, who is 666. What is the mark of the beast? All we have to know is who that is. Who those, those things are referring to. And the, the message of the book of Revelation is a snap. There are no great deep theological principles in the book of Revelation. None. <clears throat> and once we get the figure, well, how do you know the figures are right? Well, how do I know any figure is right in the scripture? I make sure that, first of all, those figures fit in the context of the book of Revelation, and then I make sure those figures don't contradict any other clear passage of scripture. When I do those two things, then I can take confidence in my definition of the figure. Who is, let me ask this, I might be going out on a limb here. And much of this study, and we'll get into this the next week or two. We're not going to get into the date of the book and when it was written yet, but we must get into that. The great enemy of the book of Revelation is, of course, Satan. And Satan is using the Roman Empire. He is using the Roman emperors as the great enemy. And have you heard, have you ever heard about a beast in the book of Revelation? Yeah, the beast. That beast, that first beast, and you've got other beasts. You've got the land beast, the sea beast. We're going to talk about all that. And like I've promised, probably in two weeks, maybe next week, but probably in two weeks, I'm going to hand you, and I'm going against my principles of teaching any subject when doing this. A lot of times people ask, well, can I have your notes? Can I have your notes? Can I have your notes? You can never have my notes at the beginning of a class. You may have my notes at the end of the class. You're not going to get the easy way out. <coughs> You've got to know this first. 
You've got to get this in your mind. You've got to put it in your mind without that. And then to keep it there, then you can have notes. And you can have figures. But, because this is such a figurative book, I'm going to hand you a nice, neat, compact... <laughs> it's like the fish that keeps growing. Yes. Sheets of the figures in the book of Revelation. And all you need to do is take those figures and see what those figures are, then go back, read the text, and put the definition of the figure in it. Who the great dragon is, who the great ore is, who the great, you know, all of that. And then you're going to see how simple this book is. Because you're, then your mind's not going to say, well, I don't know what that figure is. Oh, yeah, you do know what the figure is now. And you are welcome to take issue as much as you want with those definitions of those figures. And that's why there are so many commentaries written on the book of Revelation. But guess what? I've got some more good news for you that's going to show us how easy this book really is. You're going to take those figures, and you may disagree <coughs> with some of my definitions of the figure. You know, I, I have compiled this from many different writers and commentators on the book of Revelation, and guess what? Probably uh, a grand total of zero degree uh, agree on every specific figure. But you know what? There can be some latitude there, and you still get the main thrust of the book. Now, we're going to study some things here in a, in a week or two that will take us different approaches to studying the book of Revelation that really pervert the book. And we'll get into that. But anyway, that's coming. I didn't want to pass that out today because I wanted to teach the next couple of weeks and not see you all going through all those figures. But we'll get to that. Rome and its emperors. That was the problem. It is so important. It is so important that we take off our glasses, our 21st century glasses. And what kind of glasses do we put in our context, as the case may be? First century. It is the chore. It is the responsibility of every Bible student, no matter what book they're studying, but especially... Figurative books like Ezekiel and Daniel and Zechariah and the Revelation to take off 21st century glasses and to do two things. Number one, get into the mind of the person writing the book. Why is he writing it? Number two, to get in the mind of the hearer. And how is he hearing it? How is he supposed to be hearing it in the context in which it was initially written? If you don't do that with an, especially a figurative book like Revelation, you are hopelessly lost from the get-go. And that's why in a, in a week or two we must study when it was written because there are two primary ideas about when it was written. Some hold to the early date before the destruction of the temple in AD 70, and some hold to the later date, the end of the first century, either the, during the Neronian persecution or the Domitian persecution. And I don't even want to tip my hand to what I believe on that yet, because we'll get to that later. All right. So then... What are the factors that prompted the writing of the Revelation? Number one, and this question is probably of most interest to those of you in the class. Why was it written in apocalyptic language? Why was it written in figurative language like this, with the apocalyptic style? And number two, why was it even written in the first place? Can you see that a book well introduced is a book half taught? Because if we can get firmly in our mind the answers to these questions, we are at least 20% down the road. How many of us have stopped reading the Revelation because of the apocalyptic style? 
we don't want to take the time. We don't want to, we want, if I may borrow the phrase, we don't want to take a muscle and a shovel and try to uncover what those figures mean. That's not easy for us. We are busy people. Far be it from us to try to uncover that, but it's going to take muscle and shovel. Maybe that would have been a good title for this book. You know, the, 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 the names of the books, the titles of the books of our Bible are not inspired of God. Those were man-given. I think if I were to entitle this book after having read the book by the same name, I would call the Reverend Muscle and a Shovel. Or I would call it Neglected. Apocalypses were written during times of crisis, during times of great danger and distress. The personal safety of both writer and reader was in danger if the persecutors understood the true meaning of the book. That's why. Now, we may not like that reason. But that's why it was written in this kind of language. The book was written in code form that would protect not only John. In just a minute, Reagan's going to come and give us a little uh, thumbnail sketch of Patmos that he has up there. John was on the Isle of Patmos, and why was he there? John got the lesser of punishments given by I better not say the emperor here or I'm going to tip my hand <clears throat> given by Rome see a lot of times they would throw the lines and burn at the stake John was exiled to Patmos and that's where some who received the lesser penalty were banished but if this treatise that was written in code form by John got out to the Romans, he probably wouldn't have lived to finish the book. And so to protect the writer and to whom it was being written, it was written in code, we might say for protection. And since the Romans could not break the code, Christians could not be accused of circulating treason and seditious material. That's why it was written in ap apocalyptic style. The second question, why was it written at all? You know why it was written? Because of Satan. And to comfort first century Christians from the attacks of Satan. In the first 11 chapters of the book, the earthly foes are attacking the church, led by Satan. In the last, uh, in Revelation chapter 12, we have a, a, a change, we have a sudden change in the, in the play. And when you think of Revelation, I want you to think of John on the Isle of Patmos, and there are going to be some good pictures here that Reagan's going to have where John perhaps was, at least according to tradition. And John, picture him in a playhouse. And he is watching a play unfold before his eyes. That's the revealing, the revelation. That's what he's seeing. He is seeing the revelation as a play, as a production. And that's what he's relating. Think of you uh, describing a play to somebody or, you know, even a movie that you go to see and you are describing it act by act, play by play. But in some of those acts, and, and this is going to make Revelation a lot easier for us too. Remember, it is a cyclical book. It, it, John is relating what he's seeing in this play in cycles and guess I bet you cannot guess how many cycles there are in the book of Revelation. In fact, I'm going to give you seven passages in the book of Revelation that ends with the end of the earth. And it's the same act over and over again. 
when we think of numerology in the book of Revelation, how many of those acts that are repeated over and over again, how many do you think there might be? Seven. Imagine that. Seven churches in Asia Minor. Seven acts. Seven, seven, seven. What does seven mean? Completeness, seven days in a week. Oh, yeah. Seven cycles of Revelation. Have you ever heard of the seven cycles of Revelation? Maybe not. See? Don't throw away the book. It's going to be easier than you think. <clears throat> These cycles include this. The coming of the gospel. Or the coming of Christ. Number two, the persecution of the saints. Number three, earthly judgments on the wicked. Number four, the vindication of the saints. And number five, glimpses, just glimpses, of heaven or hell on judgment day. Those five things are in seven cycles throughout the book of Revelation, and they're all done, every one of them, in figures that you and I don't understand. Unless we take some time to figure out the figures and put them in a complete whole. I'm telling you, if you will put a little time and effort into this, when we get to the end of the book of Revelation, you're going to hit yourself on the head and you're going to say, is that it? That's all this book is? That's all? That's all the man just repeated it and that's all that it is? Yes. I think I mentioned last week about after my third time through it. I couldn't believe it. Because like many of you, I, I believe this stuff that it couldn't be understood. It's so difficult. You know, you've heard it all. And it's not that way at all. It really, really isn't. Figurative versus literal language. We must understand this. We cannot spend too much time in understanding this before, um, before understanding, contemplating this. I mentioned this a little bit last week, and I'm mentioning some of the things I mentioned last week because last week we weren't prepared to record the class or the stream, and we're doing that now. So that's why you're hearing some of this again, but it won't hurt us. The bottomless pit. What did we say about the bottomless pit last week? There's no such animal. There's no such thing. If it's a pit, what does it have? A bottom. <coughs> so that ought to tip me off right now. Does the Bible contradict? Well, of course not. What about a spirit being, being held by a literal chain? Whether that spirit is the Father, Son, or Holy, or whether that is Satan or an angel, do you think those spirits can be bound or held by a chain? Oh, but we are going to study, Lord willing, when we get to chapter 20, about the binding of Satan by that chain. Just keep that in the back of your mind for a while. Let that soak in a little bit when we get there. Oh, by that time. You will know what that is. You will know. We took the example of baptism, water baptism. You know, Lord willing, we'll have somebody baptized today in water. Literally or figuratively? Literally, yeah. We're literally going to take a body... And we're going to take that body and we're going to physically, actually, literally, materially immerse him, baptize him. Literally. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, literal or figurative? Figurative. Figurative. Good. Now, were there some literal signs that indicated they were being baptized in the Holy Spirit? Yes. There were some literal signs. There were physical signs, right? 
cloven tongues that looked like fire sat upon their head when they were baptized, when the apostles were baptized, when the apostles were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but they weren't immersed in anything literally. They were still sitting there as those cloven tongues were. They weren't immersed, but they were baptized. So that wasn't a literal baptism. There is a difference between that which is literal and that which is actual. If you are a child of God, the Holy Spirit dwells within you actually. He does not dwell in you physically. And the purpose of this class is not to discuss the theology of that, but just to give an example that we must understand in the Bible the difference between literal and figurative. It is, that comes with great consequence, a proper understanding of that. Jesus said he was the bread of life, literal or figurative. He looked like a loaf of bread? No. He was the door. He was the lamb of God. We have to understand the difference between literal and figurative. When Jesus says, when he instituted the Lord's Supper, he took the fruit of the body and said, this is my blood. Really? Literal or figurative? Was the blood of his veins in that cup that he passed out? Did it somehow miraculously, as a prominent religion teaches, turn into the actual blood of Christ? See, all of this stems, and a faulty understanding of the book of Revelation stems from not understanding... The, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's not a difficult subject in the Bible. What makes it difficult? Same thing that makes the book of Revelation difficult. Not really grasping literal versus figurative. Some people have told me this. Now don't hold this against me. I see your father in you. <laughs> literal or figurative? Have you cut me open and you've seen him in me? But the Holy Spirit is in you. Can I cut you open and see the Holy Spirit in you? And if the Holy Spirit is literally physically in you, what is he doing in there? Most of our brethren say, yeah, he's in there, but he's, we don't know what he's doing. Really? That's not how he indwells you. But he's in you and he does indwell you. Not physically, not literally, but personally and actually, but figuratively. You see how much of this stuff, things in the Bible, are predicated upon a knowledge, a working knowledge of the difference between literal and figurative. The Word of God is in me. The word of God is in you, literally or figuratively. Correct, figuratively. And the more that I put the word of God in my mind, the more that the spirit dwells within me and a greater influence he has. The more I allow the spirit of Satan in my mind, the more that Satan is in me. It's not demonic possession where you have to perform an, uh, uh, perform an exorcism to get Satan out as was taught in the movie back in the 70s with the same title. And some people believe that the spirit is in there like that. I want to say the kindest word that I can but still get across my point. Ridiculous. So very important. Figurative language. When figurative language is used, there are things in common. Some of those things are these. There's a historical significance based on a real situation. There is many times... Pseudonymous authorship. 
You don't always know who that author is. Pseudo. In the book of Revelation, we have that. There are visions and dreams. You know the visions and dreams you have? Are some of them kind of weird? <laughs> well, there are a lot of visions and dreams in apocalyptic language, and that's why some people think Revelation is kind of weird. Not as many dreams as visions, but you understand the point. Prophetic and predictive elements that we don't know. That's why Revelation seems kind of weird. John was a prophet. One of the blessings of being baptized in the Holy Spirit was that the Spirit would show them things to what? To come. To come. That's prophetic. John was a prophet. John was prophesying about things that were to come. Specifically, what Rome and the Roman emperors were going to do to the Christians in the first century. What? How, how do we view that then? We're not in the first century. Well, the principles are the same. No matter who Satan's enemies are. Have you ever, have you been engaging? Are you in the battle of Armageddon now? See, the way we approach this book will even determine what you believe the battle of Armageddon is. We're in it. We're fighting, we're fighting Satan and his forces now. The battle of Armageddon started at the cross. And it won't end until the Lord comes again. That's one of these seven cycles in the book of Revelation. Symbols and pictures and strange figures accompany figurative language. The dramatic element is always there. John is seeing the drama unfold. When we read this, we're going to read a drama. But you know what also is characteristic of apocalyptic language? It's reassuring, and it's poetic. So, with first century glasses on, we're going to go across land and sea to the Roman Empire, back in the first century, to Asia Minor, and the seven churches. And Reagan is going to be making his way up here now, at this strategic spot in our study. And he's going to unveil Patmos for us. He was just there a couple of weeks ago. I said, Reagan, can you come and talk to our class for 10 or 15 minutes about Patmos? He said, Dad, I'm ready to talk about Patmos anytime. <laughs> so we'll see. to try to keep this quick and sweet. Though Patmos, it was a banishment island. There are some interesting facts to know. Um, Patmos. Let me get my notes here. <clears throat> Patmos was about 70 miles southwest of Ephesus and was about 20 miles in circumference. Earlier it was called by Serratus and was a good place for banishment, as my father has already spoken about. Um, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Revelation 3. Revelation 3. Can anybody tell me what the dead church was? Which one that was? Sardis. Sardis, that's correct. Um, and John was writing there, or the Holy Spirit through John, talking about he will come like a thief in the night. In history, there was a Persian king named Cyrus II. And he was taking over Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And in 546, he came to this city that was well known for its fortifications, and it was never taken again. And he came in like a thief in the night, and he took over this city. So about 500 years earlier, they knew of their history. We know of our history for 200 some years. Um, in the same chapter, the lukewarm church, which was. Laodicea. Yeah. And they and John spoke about them being lukewarm. Now in the Roman Empire, these cities would have terracotta pipes either through aqueducts or through underground pipes. Um, and these pipes would run for miles and miles. 
and there was calcium built up in these terracotta pipes, which would decrease the flow of water to the city, let alone with the miles it had to travel. So by the time it came to the city of Laodicea, the water was lukewarm, therefore they stood out. So not only are these illustrations figurative, but they're actual, actually literal, or literal. Um, Patmos was one of the original Greek islands, and it was known for both its history and its natural beauty. Um, the Dorians were the first inhabitants of Greek islands or the Greek peninsula, and they were a little bit before 500 BC, and then came the Ionians and then um, the Hellenists. Um, you can tell by the Greek columns which phase it was. The Doric were the first um, I guess the uh, latest uh, BC columns in the Ionians and the Hellenistic. Also, the goddess named from Latinus or Mount Latinus of Turkey, Asia Minor, where the goddess Diana was worshipped. My father spoke about emperor worship and just worship in general. Um, can anybody tell me what a free city within the Roman Empire was? A free city. Tarsus was um, a free city. Ephesus became a free city. They believed that they had emperor worship, they would uh, be relieved of taxes to the Roman Empire. So they would do a lot of emperor worship, like Caesarea, many people know as Caesarea. They became a free city. They worshiped the emperor so they could have his good graces. Um, and they say John was. Um, Banished because he did not do emperor worship. Um, the island under Roman occupation. During the period of the Roman rule, the island fell into decline. The population decreased, and the island was used for a place of banishment for criminals and political and religious troublemakers. In 95 AD, John the Revelator was sent into exile on the island. John remained on the island for 18 months, during which the time he lived in a cave below the hilltop of the Temple of Diana. In this cave exists a, a small hole. Bob Putnam had what it would have been like in the first century. Now in this, just like just about any uh, Christian history, they built over things. And they want to make it spectacular, put gold. Um, this next picture you can see a little closely. So with that golden gate or fence, that's where his head would have been. And you can see the hole to the right up there. They believe that's where he would put his hand to get up off the ground. Um, this is what it would have been like in the, yeah, there's where he would have put his head. And then you can see, he could see out from the eye of the patents, which, let's see, let's see. Um, what it would have been like. All right, defending against the invaders. In 313 AD, Christianity was officially recognized as the religion of the Roman Empire. And from this time, the new faith spread rapidly um, throughout the Greek islands. The Eastern Christian Empire of Byzantium exercised control, control over the island of Patmos. And in the fourth century, the ancient shrine of Diana was torn down. Directly upon its foundations was erected a church declared to St. John, but this church was itself destroyed sometime between the 6th and 9th centuries when the island was subjected to frequent raids by the Arabs. With the fall of Constantinople in 1453 AD, um, the Ottoman Empire seized control over not only Asia Minor, but the Greek Peninsula and the Greek islands as well. Um, they destroyed just about everything. And then this, this was the monastery, the fortifications, Mr. Putnam uh, drew, drew for us. Um, a lot of it's kind of torn down just because of the frequent raids and the fall of the Byzantine Empire. Um, and this is me <laughs> in the island of Patmos. Uh, we had a, uh, I guess, there was a lady that was our guide, and she was from London, 
and she had glasses that looked like Elton John would have worn them. <laughs> so we thought it'd be fine to get ourselves a pair, and I went ahead and took this picture. But I want to thank you all for the support you showed me and um, the dedication you had to um, get me overseas and have an experience of a lifetime. Thank you very much.